stage is all yours. Thank you. I just want to say thank you to the organizers of the conference for inviting me. It's nice to be in Hamburg. Uh, true story, usually my airfare is booked for me, but I was left to book my own ticket on a train. I was in uh, Block Show Europe, and that's right in Berlin, so like, how hard could it be to book a train to Hamburg? But somehow I almost booked my train to Frankfurt. I guess being an American in my semantic net, Hamburg and Frankfurt, you know, the two great German meat cities that make Americans want to grill outside, I guess. But anyway, I'm here presenting to you guys, instead of in Frankfurt, presenting to no one, on uh, enabling the internet of value. Um, so how did we get to where we are today? I think a lot of us were inspired by Bitcoin arriving on the scene. And I think we're seeing play out um, a set of events that we've seen with other technologies before. Uh, when the car first came on the scene, there was the Ford Model T, and it was just a car that, you know, just one, one product. And over time, as that product matured, it became, um, it became um, modified to be specific to different use cases. We had trucks to carry heavy goods, sports cars, and we had um, lighter vehicles and a whole uh, broad array of products, all aimed uh, at the same technology, but aimed at different use cases. And I think we're seeing the same thing today. We have this new technology, blockchain, and we have all of these different use cases that people want to apply that technology to, payments, securities, reconciliation, trade finance. Uh, you probably are, are well aware that we have this put everything on a blockchain thing. People are, there's probably hundreds of use cases that people are considering applying this technology to. Uh, but one of the things that we noticed is that at the root of most of these blockchains is a payment. So if it's trade finance, when the trade is financed, there's going to be a payment. If it's security, the security is going to be purchased, there's going to be a payment. If it's lending, when the funds are borrowed, they're delivered, there's going to be a payment. If it's a smart contract that's managing someone's money, there's going to be payments. So what we observed is that the main problem at the root of all of these use cases is payments. Good payments make all of these use cases easier. Bad payments make all of these use cases harder. So that's where Ripple comes in. Ripple's been working on this payment use case. Um, we have over 210 team members. Now it's over 250. Our main offices are in San Francisco. And we've taken on as our vision the internet of value. And by that I mean moving money the way you move information. If anybody has tried to move money internationally, you know that you have to be very, very concerned about all of these details. It's slow, it's expensive. PayPal doesn't interoperate with mobile money solutions. Everything is just a different liquidity silo. And our vision is to move money as easily as you send an email. And I think a lot of us thought that Bitcoin was going to do that. If you were here from the early days, we just thought, well, everybody would use Bitcoin, and then all of these problems would be solved. But instead, what happened is Bitcoin became yet another silo, and now we have some 1,500 tokens, all of which are silos that don't interoperate. So what we've really done is we solved a different problem, and we reinvented the interoperability problem on a larger scale. So we need to solve it. Our mission is to reduce friction from global payments, and that's exactly what I mean by solving that problem, allowing money to move uh, as easily as information moves. What we've seen in the market is that the demands on payments are greater than they've ever been. Um, new corporates, companies like Amazon and Uber, need a seamless global experience to be able to pay people around the world. They need those payments to occur in real time. If you're Uber and someone uh, needs money for milk, you want them to drive for Uber immediately. You want them to have the money for the milk that afternoon, that day, immediately. And you need certainty. Uh, right now, a significant fraction of international payments fail, and it's a tremendously bad user experience, even when the payment succeeds, that you don't know the payment succeeded. So you have to contact the recipient. You find out that the payment went fine or didn't. You have to track it down. We don't have the kind of tracking that we really need to have. And of course, they have to be cost effective. If we're going to have micropayments, we're going to pay for web pages pay and eliminate advertising and have these new business models where machines pay each other, um, they have to be cost effective. Payments have to be as easy as pulling up a web page. Today's payment networks don't do any of those things. They're disconnected. They're little islands. There's no connectivity between them except for individual connections that are um, all different. And that almost makes things even worse. So what Ripple's been building is RippleNet, which is a financial institution payment network. This is sort of an institutional internet of value. Um, participants in this network tend to be corporations, small banks, payment providers, remittance companies, um, institutions that handle money. 
and the, the network members, the sort of connectors between the networks are banks and payment providers. And I could almost give the whole talk on this slide because this slide is an internet of value. It's not a public open one. It's an institutional internet of value. Those hubs that you see there are connections between networks. This is not a single network. This is a connection of networks. Banks have their own networks. One of those connectors could connect to Bitcoin or Ethereum or some other, uh, some other cryptocurrency. And we built a product suite that has the pieces for an institutional internet of value, XCurrent, XRapid, and XVIA. XVIA is kind of like the browser for an internet of value. It's a way to allow you to initiate global payments with certainty. It's kind of like a way to make requests, but in this case, the requests are payments. XCurrent is kind of like the router for the internet of value. It connects networks and provides real-time settlement and bi-directional messaging. And I, and I, and I want to focus on the bi-directional messaging. Bi-directional messaging is something that happens everywhere on the internet. Everything that happens on the internet involves bi-directional messaging. But believe it or not, most international payments are unidirectional. What that means is the money is just sort of pushed out there. You sort of push the money out, and you hope that it gets to where it's supposed to go. There's no pre-negotiation of fees. There's no verification of the recipient. There often isn't even a return push message when it gets there. So this, this is a, a very, very important difference. Um, and rich data attachments, which are necessary for things like remittances. And also, I think atomic settlement is extremely important. This is another thing that we understand in the blockchain space, but that has been sort of missing from traditional finance. In traditional finance, money is sort of moved around, and things like insurance or trust are used to make sure it gets to where it's going. XCurrent performs an atomic settlement, which means that either all the money moves or nothing happens at all. XCurrent currently has over 100 customers uh, globally, and these are mostly banks. XRapid, I think, is the product that's probably the most interesting to people in this audience. It's a way to actually settle institutional payments using XRP, currently targeted primarily at remittances. What it does is it provides the liquidity piece. Now, I, th I think it's important to call out a difference between how we're doing it and how like a traditional blockchain company might do it. A traditional blockchain company might build a remittance app and then try to market it to individuals. They might try to get partners to get cash in and cash out. They would struggle with regulatory issues. Are they going to be a licensed money service business? We're sort of going the opposite way around. We're going to companies that are currently in the remittance business, and we're saying, you have all the partnerships to do remittance. You are licensed remittance businesses, money service businesses. You have cash in locations. You have cash out locations. Why don't you use a digital asset just to provide the liquidity between the two fiat assets? That way, you don't have to pre-fund. That way, you don't have to settle. It'll be cheaper. It'll be faster. And that's what we built with XRapid. Uh, it's an easier sale when you ask a person to do one thing differently than when you ask them to do their entire business differently. So how XRapid works? An originating financial institution wants to make a payment, let's say from the United States to Mexico, and they go to a traditional crypto exchange. I, I say traditional crypto exchange. It's kind of funny, but a uh, crypto exchange. <laughs> Someone told me that I didn't want to finance the traditional ICO route, and I burst out laughing. There's a traditional ICO route now? How long have these things been around? Anyway, so you go to an exchange, and it can be Bitstamp, and you exchange US dollars for XRP, and then you send that XRP on the ledger to an exchange in Mexico, let's say Bitso, and then you exchange for local fiat. And the important thing about this flow is that there's very limited exposure to volatility. Um, XRP's price could go up or down, but since this only takes a minute or two, um, that's almost irrelevant. This entire flow takes between one and two minutes, which means volatility is not really an issue. The digital asset that we're using to settle these international payments is XRP, so I want to talk a little bit about what XRP is. Um, not all digital assets are the same. Digital assets have differences in technology, differences in use case, and so on. Um, and I think the focus should be on the use case. Uh, the, the crypto markets tend to show tokens rising or falling as a unit. There doesn't seem to be that much distinguishing in the price. But I think in terms of the long-term success of these projects, they have to have some sort of a real use case. And it's not enough to say smart contracts. Like, smart contracts for what? It's not enough to say Internet of Things. Like, what specific Internet of Things are you doing? Um, cloud storage, anonymous transactions, all these different use cases. And again, I, we think they all come back to payments. So fiat currencies are backed by governments. Governments ensure their scarcity and value. Digital assets, of course, are not backed by governments. They're backed by cryptographic algorithms. And what I mean by that is that their scarcity and value is ensured by cryptographic algorithms. Bitcoin uses proof of work. Ethereum, as you know, proof of work, although Ethereum is now switching to proof of stake. They encountered some of the obstacles with proof of work. XRP uses a different algorithm that we call consensus. And I have to back up one second here and just point out 
what this algorithm is doing is solving exactly one problem, and that's it. Every other problem we can solve just by having all the data is open, so you don't have to worry about trusting someone else to know whether or not someone has the funds for a transaction. Everybody knows the transaction validity rules. They know the digital signature algorithms. You don't have to trust someone else to tell you if a transaction is valid. The only issue that you can't solve by everybody enforcing every rule is ordering transactions. You can have conflicting transactions where someone tries to send the same asset to two different people, and you need some rule to order two valid but conflicting transactions received at about the same time. That's all consensus does. So it, that is something that nobody should particularly care about anyway. It's deep in the plumbing. It just has to work. Just like if you want to spend Bitcoin, you don't care about mining. It just has to work. Uh, it's the same thing. It's just that way of resolving the double spend problem. And because we resolve the double spend problem in a more efficient way that's more cooperative than competitive, we have significantly better performance metrics than many other digital assets. Um, I would look at the mo much faster settlement. Uh, Bitcoin fees are not around $20 per transaction as they were when this slide was made, but I think it's important to point out that you're kind of at the mercy of the block size controversy, miners. Miners want larger fees. Fees, if they do get high, they can stay high for very long periods of time because the clear Clearing time in Bitcoin is slow. And of course, proof of work is probabilistic, which means sometimes there's a block in roughly 10 minutes. There can be two at about the same time. You can go an hour without a block. Uh, consensus is much more deterministic and much, much faster. And fees are extremely low, well below a penny. And because you can handle more than 1,000 transactions per second, you can clear a fee backlog faster. It's very difficult for someone to try to clog the ledger because they would have to produce very, very high volumes, even with those small fees. Um, and that compares very, very favorably to every other major digital asset. Uh, we think that's why that makes XRP useful for payments. Uh, everything, everything has value. Um, what matters is how quickly can you transfer it, how, how much does it cost to transfer it, how reliable is it, how scalable is it. If we can make tokens interoperate so that there aren't network effects, what's going to matter are these, sort of, um, these features that are use case specific. So XRP, lowest cost per transaction, lowest transaction time, highest transaction rate. Um, we've closed over 35 million ledgers, available on 60 plus exchanges. So liquidity is um, not significantly different from other, other digital assets. So I want to talk about the technology underneath uh, XRP. First of all, these are kind of the cost of admission. Every project has to have this. It has to be open source. You can't ask people to run code they can't see. It has to be decentralized. That is, there can't be someone who has the legal authority to run the system. There can't be someone who can shut it off or force people to run code they don't want to run, hold patents, none of that stuff. And it has to be reliable and secure. Um, the, the XRP ledger has been operating since 2012, um, and you know, no major issues. Um, it uses a distributed agreement protocol to put transactions in order, uh, consensus for ordering and batching. Um, <coughs> I want to call out one interesting thing that we do, which is invariant checking. Invariant checking is a security method that prevents things that you don't want to happen from happening. So for example, one thing that would be really, really bad if, would be if additional XRP were created. That would be a, a very bad thing, and we want to make sure that doesn't happen. There's probably 20,000 lines of code that could have a bug and cause XRP to be created, and saying, well, check those 20,000 lines of code, and I promise you won't find a bug, and if you do, please let me know quick. That, that's a terrible, terrible answer. Transactions operate on views and scratch pads, and then the invariant checker will say, did this transaction create XRP? And if it does, it throws away the scratch pad and creates a new view that says, this transaction broke an invariant. Somebody go fix it, but it does not allow the XRP to be created. I think that's very important. Uh, we're account-based, not UTXO-based, which means that you can change your keys without changing your receiving address. If you're a charity and you're receiving Bitcoin and you publish a Bitcoin address and you want to change your key because you don't trust your custodian, you have to publish a new receiving address and you have to move your funds. That doesn't happen on the XRP ledger. We also have tags, so if you want to receive funds for a thousand different accounts or customers, you don't have to create a thousand different accounts on the ledger or a thousand receiving addresses. You just assign them tags and you're only watching one receiving address. It's a lot cleaner and neater. Um, we have function-specific transactors like escrow, payment channel, and check. We're not like uh, Ethereum where you can program it to do anything you want, and we're not like Bitcoin where we have very limited fixed function transactors. We're sort of in the middle with transactors aimed at the payment use case. 
And because we're aimed at the payment use case, we don't have to keep innovating new features for more and more obscure use cases. We can stick to reliability and performance for the use case we're targeted at. We have a decentralized exchange built into the ledger. We have peer-to-peer -peer credit. You can configure what assets you are willing to accept as payment. And we have pathfinding and multi-currency payments that can draw down on multiple order books. So if I have XRP and I want to pay you US dollars, or I have Bitcoins and I want to pay you Ethereum, the system will find a path for me to make that payment, and it will draw across multiple order order books to keep the prices low. Um, so RippleNet is essentially our enterprise version of an Internet of Value. We're working on the Interledger protocol to have a more sort of open community version of that same Internet of Value. Um, and I just want to say one thing about uh, where this technology is going. Sort of Bitcoin came at us as a sort of done deal, and we kind of are in that second stage where we're taking it apart, seeing what it does, and trying to use it to solve our existing problems. The opportunity, the thing that excites us, is solving the problems that we don't know we have, that kind of third stage. I don't think we know yet who's the Google of digital assets, who's, you know, who's going to be the, the big killer app, what are the Twitters, what are the Facebooks. We don't know that yet. And I think it's going to be exciting to find out. I'll call out interoperability as a big one. Allowing devices to pay each other and micropayments are going to enable a world where payments just go on invisibly all around us. And I don't think we yet know what that's going to mean. Hopefully good stuff, not bad stuff. And thank you. Don't run away, David. Don't run away. There will be questions. Hey. Oh, you want me to take David. questions? Yeah. I hope there will be some questions. Oh, okay, uh, sure. That's, that's the most interesting part, I will say. Excellent. So, please, your questions to David. There's one. Theo, you're first. Hi. Oh, lots yeah, of thank questions. you. Um, well, stay. <laughs> at one of the uh, traditional exchanges, Bitstamp, I think in 2014 or 2015, there was some kind of freeze function executed or whatever. And how does that work? And who decides? Uh, how that's executed and just tell us about that. Thank you for that question. That's a great question. I'd love to explain that. So the XRP ledger has a freeze feature for assets other than XRP. So for example, you can represent legal obligations on the XRP ledger and you can trade them. So for example, if Bitstamp owes me one Bitcoin, I can trade that on the XRP ledger to someone else who can redeem it. Bitstamp treats that as a legal obligation. Now, legal obligations can disappear because of things that happen off the ledger. In this case, there was a dispute over the ownership of some of those funds. And Bitstamp made the decision to freeze those funds on the ledger, which is what they should do. If they're not sure whether they owe me a Bitcoin or not, the ledger shouldn't reflect the fact that they owe me a Bitcoin. Now, I just want to add this has no effect on XRP, and you can also create assets that don't reflect legal obligations. But that, that's what makes the decentralized exchange possible. Most digitized or collateralized fiat assets on the ledger are freezable by their issuer. So it's the issuer of that asset that can freeze it. So if you decide to accept dollars backed by, let's say, GitHub, GitHub can freeze those dollars, let's say, if the government like, says that you can't withdraw them. So it's an actual legal obligation tradable on the ledger. Yes, it's strictly the issuer. And XRP isn't issued by anyone, so there's nobody who could freeze it. Think, uh, yeah, Dima was <coughs> second, and yeah. David is third. My name is Dime. Uh, thank you for your speech. It was amazing, very interesting. And yeah, now I'm looking forward to buy some Ripple coins. But, Please, yeah. XRP. Uh, yeah. For, first of all, uh, I would like to ask uh, how the Ripple coins were distributed initially, and how are they distributed now? Thank you. Thank you. So. Consensus cannot accomplish the initial, the initial distribution of a digital asset. Unlike mining, it is not, um, it's, it's cooperative, it's not aversive, it's not based on game theory incentives. So it doesn't have the ability to sort of pick winners. Um, the, way the, the way the XRP ledger works, all of the XRP that will ever exist existed in the Genesis ledger and was sort of open for anyone to take. Um, kind of ironically, after we went live, there was still some XRP left in the Genesis ledger, and so people who discovered it could just sort of take it out of a, as a free pot. Uh, but what happened is the original um, founders, the original um, creators of XRP, the people who started up the XRP ledger, divided the XRP so that some of it went, was gifted to a company that eventually became Ripple, and some of it, they approximately 20%, they kept. A significant fraction of that 20% has been donated to charity. Um, a significant fraction of the 80% that was given to what's now OpenCoin is locked up on the ledger in escrow. Um, those escrows release roughly a billion XRP every month, which Ripple uses to build the ecosystem um, and to fund itself. Um, 
And what happens at the end of each month is the unused XRP over that billion is put back into escrow, adding a new month. So originally there were 55 months of escrow. I think there are about three more months now. So that provides complete transparency on the token distribution. And every quarter we publish a sort of market summary explaining how we use the XRP that we use. So it's transparent, but we do, con we do control, uh, as it comes out of escrow, Ripple controls those, those funds. David? Yeah. Um, I have a few questions about Ripple. And the first one is, how is the proprietary... I'm here, by the way, here, 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 middle. No, there you are. Sorry. It's okay. The, um, I understand that Ripple is proprietary um, technology. So are you running XRP? Is, when I buy XRP, is this token actually used when you transfer assets between corporations? That's number one, because I, I'm, 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 I could be completely wrong, but I was under the impression that there is two XRP, the, the public one for crowdfunding, basically, and the one actually used inside. No, there's, there's this, XRP is XRP. So, for example, when an, X rapid, when an X rapid transaction is done, the sender is buying XRP on, 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 an, on an exchange like Bitstamp, and they're selling it on an exchange like Bitso to get, to get Mexican pesos. So okay. the liquidity for X rapid is coming from traditional crypto exchanges. Okay, that's good. Now, when are you going for retail and how? And the other question is what happened with Stella and the team split or potentially, you know, can you give us a new story sure. on that? Thank so Ripple, Ripple has no consumer facing products and is only sort of a consumer facing brand. XRP is an open digital asset that anyone can use for whatever they want. I don't foresee Ripple directly pursuing consumer-facing products, but if, you're, if you've heard the news about Spring, which is like a sort of a venture and incubator arm, we're looking to incentivize projects to build on top of the XRP ledger. I could give a whole talk about, a whole talk about that, but I'll, I'll preserve the time. Um, Stellar, yeah, I mean, as most of you probably know, Jed McCaleb, one of our individual founders, um, had a disagreement with the rest of the team, and he founded a competing project, and you know, he's doing his thing now, and we're doing ours. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Alex? I could give a whole talk on that too, obviously. I mean, it's a huge start. That'd probably be more interesting, right? <laughs> I could charge admission for that one. <laughs> one, one day there'll be a movie. <laughs> what? Um, uh, hi, my name is Alex. Um, I have, uh, I guess, two questions. Um, one, what would you say to the critics that say that uh, Ripple is centralized and doesn't have a governance model that the crypto community wants to reflect uh, well, compared to what Bitcoin is doing or your, your other competitors? Ripple, Ripple's a company. I mean, companies aren't decentralized. The XRP ledger, Ripple has no legal right to control it. The code that controls how the ledger runs is run by the exchanges, power users, um, wallet operators. Like, we have no ability to put code in anybody else's computer. Um, so the criticism generally comes from things like the fact that Ripple holds such, such a large fraction of the tokens. We're using that to pursue use cases that I don't think you could pursue with Bitcoin. There, there is no Ripple of Bitcoin, and there couldn't be one because the revenue model doesn't work. So I would say we're different, and we're trying to do different things that are based around that difference, and I don't, think, I, I, don't think, I don't see any reason why it has to be one or the other. I think there are all these different use cases being pursued. We're working on interoperability so people can use the asset that best fits their use case. It's, it, there's no reason that, that you have to pick one or the other. I mean, personally, I have to say I'm very impressed with how organized Ripple is, the market adoption, the penetration, um, you know, how advanced you are from a technology perspective, but also enterprises being able to use it. So I'm extremely um, impressed with that. But I, at the same time, um, you know, we're looking as a community to disrupt uh, the banking institution, the financial uh, institution, and uh, how governments control our money. And yet, you know, the governance model of Ripple seems to be um, put in a, in a centralized manner, controlled by the few um, and supported by the banking institutions, which can potentially have control over what you guys are doing. Well, they can't, to disrupting they can't control the ledger. There's, I, no there's no conceivable mechanism, at least not that I can think of, where they can control it. Yes, I mean, Ripple Net that thing that I showed you, is a regulated entity. It's primarily for banks and financial institutions, and they're using it inside the same regulatory framework that they're currently using. But they're settling on a digital asset that's an open platform. And the idea is that RippleNet is in service of the digital asset. Like, Ripple's revenue is not coming from, from banks. It's, com it, you know, it's the digital asset. That's where the value is. And that's the liquidity, the pools that will be created will be accessible to anyone. Anyone can, you know, can, can become part of them and, and can draw off them. 
I, I think I would be inspired by looking at what happened with the internet. Like the internet was built by government and military. It was originally adopted by institutions. Big, uh, many of them were educational institutions, but many of them were, were big data companies. Um, and what happened is they built the very platform that eventually like reduced their control. Uh, what you're going to see is you're going to see smaller banks cutting out larger banks as correspondents. You're going to see a democratization inside banking. And as long as we, and, and, you, and you guys need to hold us accountable for this. If you see us straying from this, please, like I'm not asking for a free pass. We are going to keep that XRP ledger open. It's open source. We don't have any legal rights over it. The code that enforces all the rules is run by every single participant. We can't tell them what code to run. It really is, and certainly for me personally, the vision is to build this sort of institutional payment system settling on this very open asset. And I hope that we can sort of bring that kind of disruption from the inside. I guess another model that I would look at is how digital music disrupted the music industry. Like that made Apple a juggernaut in the music business, but it could have been the music companies. Like we still would have had the same, the same democratization of music. We still would have had you know, music that's easy to to transfer digital music, the banks, the music companies couldn't have stopped digital music, but they didn't have to be, they didn't have to be destroyed by it and Apple being the juggernaut. Like it's about, it's about allocation. I think forward thinking, early adopting banks will be able to democratize banking. So you don't think the banks can negatively, you know, influence what Ripple is doing overall or uh, potentially create more tokens to dilute the value later on? They can't create more tokens because that's enforced, as I discussed, in invariant checking. That's core enforced in the code. They could, in theory, put pressure on Ripple, um, but if you think about it, like Ripple serves itself, and so the banks have only limited amount of pressure. Like They can't really co act coordinated. It kind of gets to be a crazy conspiracy theory. But again, hold us accountable. Like Look at, look at what we're actually doing. Look at the code we're writing and, and call us on it, please, because one of the things that keeps us honest is the fact that we couldn't get away with being disciplined. Dishonest. So the day we can get away with being dishonest is the day you just have to take my word for it, and I don't want to be in that position. The, mm -hmm. the, the banks. Okay, okay. I don't know who was first, Eden or the gentleman in the back, but Eden has the mic, so you get the mic while he's speaking. Okay, Eden, <laughs> go like, ahead. This, you know, uh, it's proof, ordering. Of, proof of oh, mic. Oh, only exactly. Only it's thing proof you need to of mic. <laughs> <is the order. laughs> uh, I wanted to ask mic. about Codius. Uh, mm -hmm. What's happening with that? What are your goals for it? And 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 uh, and what? How do you see it as different from other smart contract languages? Great question, thank you. So Codius is kind of um, something that we incubated at Ripple. It's a smart contract platform that isn't tied to any particular blockchain. It's a completely neutral smart block contract platform. And one unique property it has is that it can keep a secret. And that's extremely important because a smart contract that can keep a secret can interact with the Bitcoin blockchain, it can sign transactions, it can interact with the Ethereum, it can interact with the XRP ledger, it can interact with even conventional banking systems, it can interact with web pages, things that Ethereum smart contracts can't do. We have it pretty well designed. Um, it's a lot of work to build it. Originally, we, we started this project, I think, in 2015, and we kind of dropped it around 2016 because we didn't have any use cases. We had literally zero use cases. And I know people will tell you, like, well, you can use a smart contract anywhere you want to, and then they repeat what smart contracts can do. But that's not a use case, right? I can invent any technology. You can say, well, anytime you want, and then list what the technology does. A use case is like, where's the case where you want it? Uh, just recently, the use case of being able to interoperate between ledgers in a trustless fashion has kind of come to the front. Um, it's one piece of the interoperability puzzle. So we're interested in Codius uh, again. Uh, maybe through spring, we might be interested in funding someone who's willing to build it. I don't think we have the engineering resources to do it inside Ripple. So that's kind of a community project that if there's interest in, um, we would love to see it happen because it, it helps our strategic interests and we think it's a good thing. We have most of it designed. It's just a lot of execution work. Last question, please. Hi, um, so, oh, which, which mic? Both of them? Yeah, ask just both at the I, same time. I, yeah, we'll do that. It's like uh, do, we have two, two, do we have two mics in the room? Apparently. I see yeah, Apparently I have proof have of mics. mic here. <laughs> I have ah, a question. Okay, the, the so banks, we have, then we have two questions. Okay, that's bank, fine. But I think the, 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 the gentleman first, in the back was first. I'll wait. Okay. So, so I, I was just wanting to know uh, what kind of scale the banks are currently using this to trade um, amongst each other. Because, I mean, if they're doing it on the existing, you know, traditional... Uh, crypto exchanges, wouldn't there be issues with liquidity pockets, right? Like, like for, for a bank to settle a couple billion dollars amongst each other, there is, I, I just don't see how they could possibly get to that size without materially moving the market against each other. Um, so, so no one is settling on a digital asset at scale today. Uh, what's going on at scale today is the messaging part that's able to settle on a digital asset when the liquidity is there. 
Um, whether or not the, my, what's happening on the digital exchanges right now is there are really only two participants. There's market makers and there's speculators. And that's part of what I think is making the market so unhealthy. Uh, the market makers are deathly afraid that speculators are going to see a price go up on one exchange and beat them by a millisecond and sort of you know, ma make them take a loss and vice versa. What we're trying to do with XRapid is bring to these crypto exchanges market takers, people looking for liquidity, who don't care what crypto prices are doing. The thesis is that if we do that, market makers will make more money because they won't be, there won't be people trying to force them to you know, take a buy when the price is dropping and vice versa. And they'll respond, if I see you making a lot of money, I'll make just a little bit less money and someone else will make less money still. So we think that bringing in like, real demand for payments will bring the spreads down and bring the offer volumes up. XRapid will see if we're right about that. But you're absolutely right that there has to be more liquidity. The volatility problem is solved by, by the speed. The next question is, can we solve the liquidity problem? And I think um, as XRapid scales up, we'll see whether this just brings more liquidity or in the, in the negative scenario, do we just use up all the liquidity and then the market just dies? I don't think that'll happen. I think what market makers are looking for is people to, to take the liquidity that they provide. Uh, but we'll see very soon. Do, do you have a... Okay, last question about Jed. Um, so the banks controlling and, and getting influence there is one concern, but to me it seems that there's a whole bunch of regulatory space that needs to be addressed. Um, is Ripple engaging with regulators at what, lev what level and what are you guys doing about that when they start to pay attention to your tech? Uh, absolutely, we've been engaged with regulators for some time. Um, if you talk to people in this space, they'll tell you like the biggest obstacle to adoption or the biggest obstacle to business development is regulatory uncertainty. And there's only two ways to fix that, engage with regulators or engage with courts. And I think we would all agree, I hope, that the regulator option, so uh, it, you cannot put your head in the sand on this. If, if the biggest drag on adoption is regulatory uncertainty, then the only way to fix it, other than risking going to jail, is to talk to regulators. And so uh, we put Zoe Cruz on the board, Ben Losky. Uh, we engage with regulators all the time. We travel around the world. We educate them. You don't want your first engagement with regulators to be when a crime happens, you know, and then you get the law enforcement people instead of the policy people. I, I cannot overstress how important it is. And also, just be completely transparent, because if... if Ripple has the luxury of being fairly well known. Regulators know exactly what we're doing, right? We don't have that many secrets. And so if regulators said, hey, you're obviously violating this law, you know, that we, you know, we would hear it and we would talk to them and we would engage. But I do agree that there are, reg there are certainly regulatory threats. And they're not from known laws that we're breaking. They're from uncertainty about how those laws apply. Um, and I think the entire community needs to engage with regulators. I will just call out one, one, one small thing while I have like, the microphone and the power to do so is I, I, would, I would urge other cryptocurrency projects not to try to slam the door shut behind them and not to say, hey, we're already so far along, we're too big to fail, just let us go and slam the door shut on innovation and, and new people. Um, I'm going to personally pledge on behalf of Ripple that we're not going to do that. And if you see other projects doing that, call them out on it and tell them, look, at least the marketplace thinks we're all in this together. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you, David.